Hi, this is Craig Haskell with the Value Hunt Academy. You're listening to another exclusive interview with the leading authority in the syndication of value add real estate. There are many talented people sitting on the bench wanting to get in the syndication game, but they don't. And for one reason or another, that lasts for many years, they've wanted to get in the game, but they continue to sit on the bench because they're scared, because they don't think they have enough knowledge. They're afraid to go out and talk to other investors, to speak to investors, and or they have a lot of self-doubt on the money-raising process. And if this is you, then you're going to love this interview because we're going to open your eyes. We're going to open your eyes to the four-step money-raising process that we teach at the Value Hunt Academy. And to give you an honest look from the trenches, someone just like you, we're going to be speaking with Seth Wilson, one of my students who finally got started and has had big success. And you're going to love Seth's story because he got started in this in the syndication business after living in his fifth wheel RV to save money for his business, his syndication business. And I got to tell you, he's the real deal. Seth is going to give you an inside look at his syndication business. And he's also going to walk you through the actual four-step money raising process that he went through. So in this interview with Seth, you're going to learn the big challenges, the big fears he overcame to finally get going. How he actually saw the money raising process before he started. Maybe it's like what, how you see it. And you're also going to learn why he thought syndication was for the bigger guys buying bigger deals. Why his pitch book has been so important to him and his success. How long it actually took him to create his pitch book. You're also going to learn the three big things that he did to build his investor list. How he got investors to give referrals to other investors for him. How he talks to investors about his pitch book. He's going to walk you through his approach. The three things investors are concerned about. How he creates his investor database. And finally, you're going to learn the big lessons that he's learned after going through the four-step money raising process. And if you're ready to finally get off the bench and get in the syndication game, then you must study this high-value interview with Seth Wilson. You're going to learn from someone just like you on how to raise money for those great deals you come across. Well, this is going to be a great uh, call, Seth, because I'm really excited to talk to you about the money raising process because when you got started, you were a little bit skeptical and you didn't really understand the process. It was kind of confusing. Uh, it's, it's like... A lot of people experience when they start doing this, they don't really understand. And so we started working together about three months ago when we, we went through the entire four-step process and getting your money raising uh, system set up, and you've had a lot of success. And so I want to walk through the four steps that we went through. But first, what I'd like to do is I'd like you to kind of put a little background, a, a little flavor on what it is uh, that, that we're going to be talking about and, and kind of where you came from, your, your experiences, because you've been in real estate for a little bit of time and you've had some experiences. So I, you've got a really a great story and I want you to share that story. Tell us where you came from and where you are right now. Yeah, Craig. Um, well, first off, thanks for having me on. Uh, it's really exciting to be able to talk about this. Um, yeah. I bought my first house uh, in Omaha in 2007. It was a single family house that I bought with a uh, VA loan. And I bought it, uh, I timed it perfectly, right at the very tippy top of the market. Uh, so thankfully, Omaha hasn't experienced the downturn that a lot of the other places have in the country. But uh, nonetheless, uh, I bought the house and immediately, about a year later, I realized my mistake on that. So I still own that one today. Uh, it's a great property, but uh, that's how I got started in, in real estate. And that's coming up on, let's see, nine years almost. So, oh. um, But I wanted to get involved in, in real estate and, and learn how to do it properly. So I started off with mobile homes. Um, I did that because they were small, really small. I mean, everybody tells you to start small. But my first one I bought was like $1,500. Uh, I turned around, I fixed them up, and did the rent-to-own process on them. Um, it really taught me all the different aspects of real estate, even though it's not technically real estate. Uh, then from there, I got, in, got uh, involved in some single-family residential stuff. Um, the numbers just really weren't that exciting to me. 
Um, it just seemed like a lot of work for not a lot of uh, payout. So I had kind of had my eye on to get into commercial property. Uh, I live down in Texas. Uh, I'm in the Missouri Air National Guard, and I went to Air Force pilot training. When I went down to Texas, uh, I decided that I needed to save some money to, to get into commercial property because uh, it's a much bigger uh, chunk of change to, to get started. Uh, so I did that by living in an RV for 18 months uh, with my dog, Sally. It was a fifth wheel. And I essentially lived in a trailer for a year and a half so I could save money to, to buy my first apartment building, which I did um, about eight months after I got back to Kansas City. I bought a 12-unit building. And from there, and then about a year later, almost a year later, I bought a, another 12-unit uh, with money that I had uh, raised from uh, family investors. So uh, that's kind of the the quick and dirty on, on how I got started in, in real estate here. So. Yeah, no, I love that story because it shows dedication and, and strong heart that you're going to live in a fifth wheel for 18 months and save money. Well, you, you started to make a transition, and so I want you to share, if you can, that big challenge that you had you know, to overcome to start to grow your, your business through, through syndication. What was that big challenge? Uh, well, what happened is I realized on the first uh, per building that I had purchased, the first 12 unit, that, uh, hey, you know, I'm actually making the same work, yeah, and things are starting to come together, um, and we're getting the bad tenants out, we're getting good tenants in, we're putting money in for capital improvements, all which came out of my pocket from uh, the from what I had saved uh, over that year and a half. Uh, the, the challenge was is that I wanted to grow, I wanted to scale the business and, and get larger. However, I would constantly have to sell to buy something else, if that made sense, just to you know, kind of flip-flop one for the other. Doing a lot of reading and understanding about what uh, other people, the big guys had done, like George Perez and Sam Zell, things along those those guys. And I realized that if I wanted to get serious in this and scale my business, I was going to have to raise money from investors. And how do I go about doing that? You know, uh, that was the real big, uh, it was a complete unknown to me, and that's when I came to you. Uh, really not having any idea of how to go about doing that and buying larger properties, uh, making more money for myself and investors. So there was a lot of stuff that I didn't understand, um, how to go about it, you know, legal issues, and uh, I had some I had some skewed uh, perceptions as well when I got started too. Yeah, so all of a sudden now you got to, you're thinking about raising money and you had a certain perception of that process. What if you could share what that was before you got started? Yeah, um, well, it, it's kind of, I felt like I was asking people for money. I felt like I would have my hand out, you know, and my hat in my hand saying, hey, could you could you lend me some money so I could go buy this building? Um, and uh, I had some success in some other buildings I've done, but, uh, you know, I'm just going to go out there and buy something else that's kind of like these buildings and see what's going on. So I really didn't have a very a good idea of how to go about it. Uh, I kind of had almost like a shame of thinking that I was going to ask people for money or hitting them up for money. Uh, I thought it was going to be like a real hit or miss process, uh, just trial and error. Um, so I realized that I could either figure out how to do this on my own over the next, you know, three, four, five, six years, however long it took me, uh, or I could get serious and find someone to help me out. So I also kind of thought that um, syndication was only for people that were already big. So guys are already yeah. like buying a couple million dollar deals or whatnot. But then I had a then I had this revelation that the only reason that they are big is because they are syndicating. So it, it yeah. kind of chicken or the egg. And um and that's kinda of when I had that epiphany that uh, I need to get serious on this. You know, you think about some of the big properties, you you drive down Main Street wherever wherever you live, and eighty percent of the properties are all syndicated. It's all money that's been pooled together to buy it because you know, those are big properties. It takes a lot of money to buy those properties. So so there is a lot of syndication that goes on. And and you got to the point, you said, okay, let's get let's work together. Let's get my system set up. And so what we did was we set up really the four-step money raising system, the first four steps from creating your pitch book to creating your list to uh, doing investor meetings and building your database. And so we set all that up. So uh, let's talk about the first step. Let's talk about the pitch book. And from, from your words, from your understanding of what, what a pitch book is now that you've gone through the process, why don't you could share what, you, uh, what a pitch book is in your eyes and share us the process that you went through putting together that pitch book. Yeah, um, well, a pitch book, it almost sounds a little corny, like you're pitching like a movie or something to some studio executive. <laughs> but uh, 
you know, we can call it whatever you want, but ultimately what it is, it's it's my communication device. It's like a, a translator that takes my knowledge and vision that I have now. It makes it easy for everyone to understand what it is I'm doing, what I've done, and what I'm going to do uh, from the, the layman potential investor that just has, uh, they're sitting on some money that's put to work to a real estate professional. So it really is my communication device. Um, but really, it could also be considered like a business plan explained. So when I show this to other professionals, that's what they call it. It's like, well, you know, they call it my business plan. Um, and I never really thought of it that way um, until they started calling it that. And it's just explained. It's um, it, When I was building it, it really made me take a look at uh, what is, it is that I'm doing, what it is that I'm going to do, and made me really stick to it. So I put it down on paper, and I had a designer make it look really nice. And it's telling people not only what I'm going to do, uh, excuse me, it doesn't tell people just what I have done, but it also shows people what I'm going to do. So I'm not distracted, uh, you know, chasing rabbits like you like to say. Yeah, and and so um, as you went through the process, and and you know everybody has challenges uh, along that way of putting together the pitch book because there's a lot of research involved, or you're trying to figure out what it is you're trying to focus on that one rabbit. I wonder if you could share some of the challenges that you specifically went through with us. Yeah, um, well, of course there was some self doubt uh, if I could even pull this yeah. whole thing off. Uh, type, um, you know, kind of the thought that, you you know, you're not going to be able to make this work, and I still had that problem with thinking that I'm asking people for money. Um, but as the pitch book progressed, uh, some of the other challenges that I came up with are, it says, you really need to decide what it is that you're going to do. You really need to decide what it is that your business is going to look like next year, three, five years from now. And you need to make that commitment now. Um, so it was almost like a, I don't want to say a fear of commitment, but it was a fear of locking myself in to something. But then I started looking around, and I was like, this is what I, this is what I do anyway with these buildings. I, I buy mismanaged properties, and then I re-tenant them to the middle market, uh, middle market tenant. So that's what I do anyway. So why am I afraid to write this down? So, uh, you know, I wrote it down, made it look really good, and... Um, and went from there. So that was kind of the challenge, the self-doubt and then locking myself into to my niche strategy. Yeah, you came up with a, a nice investment strategy, and, and we and we found it sitting right in with what you were doing. You you bought in a couple properties from from tired and overwhelmed property owners who decided that they they didn't want to be in the real estate business anymore. And you bought those properties and you and you repositioned them towards a certain tenant group. And we basically built your pitch book around that strategy, and it gave you focus on what it is you're doing. It gave you focus when you're out talking to investors. Yeah, the focus is is, is number one. What uh, you really have, have forced me to do, uh, which, of course, I appreciate, is, is take a look at what it is that a business is now with the couple of uh, 12 units that I had, and then how am I going to make that bigger? So I also kind of have the self-doubt that, Oh, well, people that own 150-unit buildings, they're sophisticated investors. They know what they're doing. They have great professional management. Um, that's kind of something that I had thought, uh, which is not true either. Um, some of those guys just have some money they put it together and they see they throw it at the wall and see if it sticks. Um, but so far as uh, just giving me that focus, that was great. Uh, it, yeah. it not only said, this is what I'm going to do, but these are the properties that I want. This is the market that I want. These are the problems that I want the property to have because I know how to fix those. Um, and I can also take those problems and, and make it a large um, gain for myself and, and investors as well. So I really got specific and focused on what it is that I'm doing. And I actually had a meeting with a broker, uh, I guess, last week, and, and he had this, oh, he had a screaming deal. You know how they always have these great deals. Yeah. And he told me about it. And uh, I went out and drove by it. I told him, you know, that's a great price, and that's going to make somebody a lot of money, but it's not in my niche. It's not what it is I'm looking to do. Uh, they have some problems that uh, that I'm not familiar with and I'm not willing to deal with. So I, I took a pass on that. Beautiful. Love that story. So so let's, let's, let's kind of get a gauge on how long it took you to put together your pitch book from the time we, you know, started talking about ideas on investment strategy to the time you actually got the final – printed version, the final design version from your from your printer. How long did that whole process take? Well, um, that took about two months or so. 
Uh, I worked at it pretty hard. Uh, a lot of nights and weekends I put into it, uh, really tweaking it, uh, making sure there's no typos, things along those lines, because I wrote every single letter that's in that pitch book. Um, but it was also over the holidays, so I probably could have knocked off a couple weeks. And then I was also pretty um, particular about the way that the book was going to look coming from the designer. So that, yeah. that probably added a, a couple weeks as well. But uh, once I had the, the final product, I'd say probably right about two months, maybe a little bit more. Yeah, that's pretty typical two months. But I want to make sure people understand that that two months that you put this thing together, there was a lot of work like you talked about. You you wrote a lot of that in the pitch book. And you were just writing that and going through the process it got your investment strategy to stick in your head. You really understood. You really got more focused because you went through that process. And I know it probably scares some people to think it take two months. But it really takes two months to get that whole investment strategy a part of who you are. And so that when you communicate it to people, they get it. And so you kind of went through that same process, right? Absolutely. Um, I mean, every single word is in my fiber of my being, I guess, now. And when you talk about two months, it's like, you know, that's nothing, you know, I mean, that's yeah. not even a semester in college, that's, you know, that's that's not a lot of time at all, um, as far as I'm concerned, especially if you're looking at the, at the long game here, um, two months to come up with, come up with this, it, it's like a blink of an eye. Yeah, so before we go on to step two and start talking about uh, building a list, uh, I just want to finish with your thoughts on why your pitch book's been so important to you. I know it, it's helped you with uh, lenders, it's helped you with brokers, investors, and property managers, it's helped you a lot. So from from your standpoint, why has it been so important to you? Well, one of the reasons Craig it helps me out with all those people is because it gives them uh, the focus of what it is I'm trying to do. Um, you know, Sam Zell said that leadership is trying to go from point A to point B. Now, who do I need to corral to make this happen? Uh, yeah. And so I have that kind of focus. People want to be part of that team. They they want to find people like uh, like that that uh, that know what they're doing and they're not just you know kicking tires or whatnot. But number yeah. one, it adds like it just adds a ton of credibility to what it is that I'm doing. When I show this to people, you know you can almost see their eyes kind of light up because it's you know it's glossy print, it's beautiful colors. The designer did a great job. Um, there's some graphics in it. Um, now if I just told them verbally about it, it wouldn't be as exciting. But the credibility right. to my plan. It is it, great. So, and also, it really gives me something on my side that you know, deep down, like we talked about, it took two months to make it. But deep down, I know that this is what I'm going to do, and, and I'm going to be successful at it. Awesome, buddy. I'm proud of you, man. So, so let's talk about step two. Step two of the money raising process. We started to build your list of potential investors, and so I want you to kind of walk us through that process of building that list. Um, well, if you wanted me to come up with a whole bunch of names, something like 75 names or something like that, 100 names of yep. people that I thought would be interested in investing. To me, that number was so overwhelming because I was still having that mindset that I'm putting my hand out and I'm asking friends and family and business associates to, to cough up some cash so I can go off and do this thing. Um, but after a while, my mindset changed that uh, this is a great investment opportunity. Anyway, how I actually found them is uh, what I did is I went through my phone uh, with all my contacts and I started writing down the names of people that I thought would be interested. I didn't take any consideration to whether they were local or long distance or if I hadn't talked to them in a couple of years. I said, if I call these people, would they be willing to take a meeting with me? And I wrote those names down and I still came up a little short on names, so I just went through my Facebook, <laughs> through my Facebook account and found even more people that I didn't necessarily have their phone number. But uh, if they're willing to be my Facebook friend, they're probably willing to listen to what it is that I'm doing. Um, so those those were just the two ways I did it. Um, and then beyond that, uh, referrals started growing from there. Yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about was, you know, you really started to grow your list and get some pretty solid people on your list there that, that look like they're very well qualified through people you you knew and, and people you met. And so I wonder if you give us an example or two uh, of, of, of people you, you were able to add to your list through someone else. Well, yeah, there's there's some people that uh, when you talk when I talk to them, um, they're very excited about the, the opportunity. Um, they're very excited about what it is I'm doing. Uh, but for one reason or another, maybe they're unable to invest alongside of me um, because of medical issues or they have all their money tied up in other investments that they can't get out quickly. 
Um, but they would always, I would just ask, well, do you know of anyone that might be interested in this? And I was surprised at the leads that they had given me uh, from there. And, and, you know, they'll CC me on an email, or they'll text me the guy's phone number, and say, give this guy a call. He, he's very interested. And, you know, two or three days later, you know, we'll have a meeting, and, and then he leads you to somebody else. But he's interested as well. So it, it just kind of goes from there. Um, so there's some people I'm meeting with that I've never met with before, but, uh, you know, their friend gave a referral, which is, um, which is just wonderful, and, and yeah. I can go and go and talk to them. Um, and actually, it's funny because now I'm, I'm like I'm doing like a coma to just tell everybody I can. I'm sitting in the doctor's office, and I get my yearly physical, and, and I'm talking to her, and and I was telling her all about it. I didn't have my pitch book with me, and she got all excited. Says you need to talk to my husband. Well, he's the vice president of uh, commercial underwriting at a, a regional bank here. So, you know, just it's amazing how it snowballs. Yeah, it's amazing. I tell I, I tell people to be an evangelist and just be out there spreading the word. And uh, things come from left field, right field. You just never know where stuff comes from. But it's never going to come if you're not out talking about it. And you've been doing a great job about that, which kind of leads us to the next step, which is to get out and start meeting with investors. So specifically for you, how did you shape your talk towards your investors that told a story that was in your pitch book? Mm-hmm. Um, well, by the time that I'm getting ready to talk to the investors, uh, I have my mindset right. Uh, I, I know what I'm doing. I've practiced it. Um, I pitch a few times. I have my pitch book. I'm feeling good. Um, and when I go talk to investors, generally if I know who they are, uh, I can spin it towards towards them, uh, You know, just the way you know somebody. Uh, if yeah. I don't know them from Adam when I talk to them, now then I just you know shoot them straight and tell them exactly how it is that the uh, that, that isn't I'm interested in. But uh, ultimately, every investor, whether they admit it or not, is really only interested in three things um, when it comes to investments of any sort, is uh, how safe is my money? Um, so I have in my pitch book here, I have a very good example of how their capital is safe because we buy it at, at such a discount. Um, right. How fast am I going to get my money back? Uh, once again, I have a, a very nice graphic that shows the investment life cycle so they can see when they're going to start getting their their dividends and when they're going to be getting the uh, the windfall profit at the end, and then uh, how much am I going to get back on top of my initial investment? And that's the least important question, but that's the most exciting, right? It's the sexy one because they can tell everybody at their cocktail parties. So what I do is I show them how yeah. well I did in my past. So when it comes to shaping my talk to them, it's really those three questions that everything is building towards, uh, whether I actually say it or not, and uh, to give them that warm fuzzy that this is going to work. Well, and I, I know as, as as time went on, things changed, but when you first got started, what were some of the big fears you had when you talked to investors, and, and what are the, some of the things you you did to overcome it? Uh, well, you know, Craig, when I first got started, um, I would talk to people, whether they be brokers or bankers or whatever, and I just really felt like I was not being taken seriously. Um, you know, they were being polite and whatnot, uh, but I was essentially looking back at it, I was just kind of lacking credibility. Um, so I was concerned that starting to talk to these people again, uh, you know, I just wouldn't be taken seriously, but that's the exact opposite of what's happening. Actually, some of them, you know, will have a meeting scheduled for 20 or 30 minutes and I'll be there for an entire hour. Um, Beautiful. so the credibility is really there and they'll give you a free education. I mean, uh, you know, I didn't come from a brokerage background or a finance background, but they'll sit there and tell you all about how things are working out there in the market now, um, you know, uh, what's going on. And they just, they're like, okay, this is a serious guy I can work with. And, and you can really tell that uh, in the way that they talk to you. So um, I really came overcame that by just knowing what it is I'm talking about. I know I've done good work, so I just need to kind of show it off. And yep. I'm finally a lot of preparation. So uh, I worked a lot of hard uh, like I said, nights and weekends. Because I'm not going to go out there and waste anyone's time. I'm just going to tell yeah. them, hit them with the facts, and uh, if they want to work with me, great. If not, then they're off. So maybe they'll come around. Who knows? Well, I know it got easier for you because you would you would literally just get in front of the mirror and, and practice, you know, your talk, and we would role play together. And over a, a period of, of weeks, uh, you got better with your talk, and you got more confidence, right? Yeah, I would actually practice in my car, uh, <laughs> which is kind of oh, goofy, I guess. But think about how much time you spend in your car. 
and uh, you know, 40 minutes, you can do your pitch two, three, four times in that time. So, um, and I just did that over and over again, and I'm sure people thought I was a crazy person, but that's the preparation that I felt was required. Right, and that's why you got good at it. That's why you had so much success. Were there any sort of surprises you might have had uh, during your meetings? I mean, something, something that popped up that was a kind of a surprise. I, uh, you know, I really can't say that I had a lot of negative surprises. Um, like I said before, uh, meeting with people uh, a couple of years ago when I first got started uh, in apartment building, um, you know, people were just kind of very, yeah, whatever, towards me. Uh, I'm really just been surprised about how excited and eager people are to help me out, uh, work with me, um, and invest their money with, with myself and my team. And if they can't do any of that, then they refer me to someone else. Um, so it, it's always, every meeting I have is, is a win-win in some sense. And every meeting I have, one way or another, gets me closer to where it is that I want to be. So I've really been surprised about how quickly things have accelerated since I started talking to investors and everybody else about a month ago, actually a little bit less than yeah. that. Because, I mean, it's, you know, these people are starting to, I have friends that are calling me now saying, hey, are you still doing that real estate stuff? And I send, you know, I should talk to them. And they're surprised about, they're like, well, I knew you were doing real estate, but I didn't know you were doing all this. Um, it's very exciting. I'm surprised about how quickly things have accelerated. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. And because, because you're focused and, uh, we went through a lot of the questions and concerns, so you kind of knew a lot of answers before they even asked them. Uh, but you have Absolutely. had pretty quick success and got a lot of people interested. So, so now we're going to go on to step four, which is we're going to build our database of, of, of people that are interested, and so we want to stay in t- contact with them. And so, so what's your, what, what are you doing to stay in contact with some of those investors that are excited to, to finally see the deal when you find it? Um, well, I'm not as sophisticated as, uh, as some people with all their fancy marketing and, and slick assistance or whatever. Slick? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I'm doing it the, uh, the old-fashioned way. I'm sending That's emails right. from my personal account. Um, and, you know, it's, it's you know, 2015, so there's Skype and email uh, and phone and all these other pieces of technology to keep in contact with people. Um, but what I'm really interested in doing is, is keeping them up to date and educating them a little bit about the investment. Um, so give them more information about the market, uh, my properties that I have now, what I'm doing with them, uh, why real estate in Kansas City is such a great, stable place to put their money. Um, mm-hmm. And just keep up to date with them on what's happening uh, in the community uh, and their interest in investing so that when the time comes that I say, hey, I have a property, they're also they're very familiar with the investment and they're not just trust, you know, blind trust or anything like that. Um, let's see what else. Oh, I'm also doing a bit of writing now. Um, I'm trying yeah. to write a small, a small book about military aviation translates and has helped has, has helped me succeed in real estate. So I'll I'll send those chapters out as I complete them. And I think it's it's a real good thing because I have a lot of Air Force friends that don't totally understand the real estate side, and I have some real estate people that don't totally understand the military aviation side. So I kind of want to show them how the how the two mix and how we can all benefit from, from the sort of discipline and training that I've had uh, in the Air Force. Yeah, that's going to be cool when you get that done. Yeah, it's going to be a while, though. It's I have a lot of yeah. ideas. Yeah, take your time, man. Just put together a nice nice a chapter overview. That's how you start. Um, well, you know, I really would kind of want to wrap this up with a, with a few more questions, uh, but... We started talking. Uh, I asked you about your perception of the money raising process, right? That was before you got going. Now that you've been through the money raising process, I want to contrast that perception from from when you got going to where you are now. So, I wonder if you could share with us how your perceptions changed today from when you got started. Yeah. Um, well, hands down, it's confidence. Uh, confidence in what it is that I'm doing. So, like I said, I felt like I was uh, asking people for money, hitting them up. You know, oh, you know, your cousin Seth has another, you know, money-making scheme or something like that. And, uh, you know, that's not the case at all when they start seeing what it is that I've done and what it is I'm doing with the with the book and everything all on those lines. So um, just having that confidence now, being able to go out and talk to people, total strangers, and, say, and understanding that I'm giving them this opportunity to make a, a very nice return um, that's passive as opposed to, Hey, uh, this is kind of what I do. Uh, it's sort of good. 
Uh, so what do you think? You know, um, it's really that confidence that I can go out there and and do that and be successful. I think I hear that a lot. Confidence is is one of the big takeaways. What do you? How how do you think you got that confidence? Um, well, it's knowing my stuff uh, and, and being prepared. Um, and that's that's all there is to it. Knowing my stuff and being prepared and having and knowing that I can go and and repeat the cycle that I've done before, and I have a very good process and I have a very good team put together. And having you know having that knowledge. And being able to project that knowledge gives you the confidence that you need. All right, good stuff. So, so Seth, looking back, let's say you're looking back over the process went went through. Uh, what are some big lessons you might be able to share through that process? It, it's it's getting serious. Uh, getting serious about what it is that you're doing. Uh, it allowed me to express uh, who I am, uh, what I'm doing, and how I can help everyone involved, um, from the tenants to the bankers brokers, investors, and how we can all succeed in this together. So um, there's a lot of things that I knew but I didn't understand. Um, you know, I, I knew that the sun came up every morning, but I didn't understand how it worked. But now that I really have gotten to work with you and Nikki, I can really kind of break out the process and see the science behind what it is that, uh, that I want to do. So that was probably the big thing. Is It's almost like a self-discovery of the um, or the big lessons that I had learned. Well, that's cool, man. So the last 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 thing I got for you is there's a lot of people like you who want to get started, who are a little bit afraid, a little bit intimidated uh, of the money raising process. What if you could share a few tips that might help them out? Um, number one is you have to get smart, right? Um, if you want to pool, if you want a pool of investors to place hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars in your hands, uh, you better know what you're doing. You better know how to make the money. You better be made of uh, good moral fiber. And uh, most of all, you better not lose their money going out chasing rabbits. So if you get that, that education and you get the, the confidence to go out there, because if you get the education, you will have the confidence to go out there and put things together. Um, so, And you really need to find someone that's been there and done that before. Because um, like I said earlier, I could have gone out and probably over the next, I don't know, two, three, four, five years, figured this out somehow. But instead, I went out and I found someone that has been there, done that, um, being with you and Nikki, and, and to really help launch my company kind of into the stratosphere there. So I'm really glad I found you guys. And uh, if you think that two months to put a pitch book together is a long time, well, you know, if you would have started two months ago, you'd be done by now. So... There's no reason to sit on the fence and say, oh, well, hem and haw over it. Just go do it. Well, that's one of the reasons why you've had so much success, uh, Seth. I mean, in a very short period of time is you take action, man. We, we put together a plan, and, and you bust your butt, and you've come so far in three months. It's, a, it's amazing. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing some of the deals. Uh, Nikki and I might be investors in your deals, but, uh, I mean, you're the perfect example of some of the lessons you just talked about uh, is being having good morals, uh, make sure you know what you're doing, and having a good plan, and not chasing rabbits. And so you've, you've uh, stood up to that. You've had success in some of the properties you've done. You've been able to translate that into in, into successful uh, case studies with some of your clients or, or some of your uh, potential investors, and it's it's uh, made you look like a million bucks. And so you're you're off to the races and look forward to being a part of your life in the future. So thanks so much, buddy, for, for getting on, on the line here. Appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this interview. For more information on Seth, you can reach him at Sierra Whiskey Properties. If you want more training on syndication, then I really encourage you guys to go over to the Value Hunt Academy and dig deep because there's lots of resources. And for those of you who are at a point in your real estate career where you're ready to take action, you're ready to step into change, you're ready to start building your wealth through syndication, and you want some help, then let's jump on the phone. Let's talk. All you got to do is contact Nikki. Nikki's email address is Nikki at ValueHuntAcademy.com. And that's spelled N-I-K-K-I at ValueHuntAcademy.com. And all you're going to do is uh, set up a call so we can get together. So for any of the questions or comments or ideas that you may have, please contact me. My email address is Craig at ValueHuntAcademy.com.